Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Podcast on Fifth Ave. We hope you had a great Christmas and that you're gearing up for an awesome <laughs> an awesome new year as well. We're glad to be back for sure. Uh, I don't remember the last time the Penguins played. And I know we say that every week that it feels like it's been a lifetime since the Penguins have played. But this time, really, though, it's been like a literal lifetime with the shutdown for Christmas that went from like a week and a half or something to no, we're going to push back a little bit further, a little bit further, an extra day. And now the Penguins game on Friday in Ottawa has been postponed as well because of attendance restrictions yeah. in Canada. Certain, yeah. Yeah, it's, certain provinces have uh, rules, 50% capacity. So Ottawa would have been limited to 9,300 fans. Um, so that's why, because the NHL postponed nine games in Canada mm-hmm. because of, in cities that are having those restrictions. And that, that makes sense because the NHL is such a gate-driven league. And when they're missing mm-hmm. out on that revenue, especially, you know, the big markets like Toronto, like that hurts everybody. It, it's mm-hmm. not just about the owners losing out because, I mean, the CBA and the NHL ensures that there's a 50-50 split between revenue and the players and the owners, so it would not just be the owners missing out. Like the the players would have to pay back that money in escrow. So, while I'm Ooh. sure the players, you know, throughout this whole thing, have been frustrated with the process of postponing games because of COVID, doing it because of the attendance restrictions, I, I don't think they they hmm. have the same objection objections to that because playing without the fans or without full capacity is losing them money too. So, the Ottawa game, I think that's best for everybody. Interesting. I didn't know that. So that actually is very helpful. For some reason, I just, I thought it was because they, I I don't even know. I just, I've been really missing Penguins hockey. So I'm a little bit uh, emotional and reading into things and taking that approach as opposed to a logical one. So (laughs) it does help to have some logic to base that on uh, just so I don't go off the rails. But so there, there are quite a few penguins in COVID protocol at the moment. Taylor, can you read us the list, yeah, please? Um, it's eight of them. <laughs> so, right, uh, Evan Rodriguez, Teddy Bluger, Tristan Jari, John Marino, Mike Matheson, and Dominic Simone were added right after the holiday break. They called up this taxi squad guys, including Pio Joseph. Pio Joseph arrived in Pittsburgh, promptly tested positive for COVID. So he's on the list. And then uh, Kasperi Kapitan tested positive on Wednesday and went into protocol. So uh, eight total guys. There's only a handful of guys on the team who have not tested positive um, all season. So, oh my Lord. yeah, but some key guys in there right now. Yeah, this is tough, too, just because obviously, like, the Penguins were, what, one of four teams that came back or that, like, didn't have anybody on the COVID list going into the holiday break. Yeah. It was one of those things that was like you kind of unfortunately with the world that we're in right now, you almost anticipated it, especially yeah. just with um, Omicron being like the dominant strain in the U.S. right now in terms of COVID and with how contagious it is. Mm-hmm. Luckily, it seems like a lot of people that get it aren't getting crazy sick. I can confirm as somebody <laughs> myself who just got over it. Um, but, you know, for these athletes, that is kind of. I guess a little bit reassuring that, you know, obviously we don't know the extent of it. You know, we're not hearing if these guys are symptomatic or asymptomatic, Mm -hmm. but most people that get COVID right now that are vaccinated, which the penguins are, they are, you know, feels like a a cold, there's some fatigue, but usually after a couple of days, they're over it. And as we've seen, the NHL has just changed their protocols to kind of reflect the CDC's new guidelines as well. Yeah, Yeah. Sullivan did say that most of – he said a couple couple of them have mild symptoms. He's not telling us what exactly or who or how many of the eight. But uh, it sounds like nothing serious right now, which which is good. And, again, like you mentioned, the the NHL, they did shorten the isolation period from 10 days to five days. So if these guys are feeling okay um, and they're not symptomatic, they they won't be without them for that long. And it's almost kind of weird, too, because – in a weird way, there could sort of a little bit be like a competitive advantage to this where it's like you're not mm-hmm. revealing guys' statuses. So, you know, potentially we don't know yet, but going into Sunday's game against the Sharks, mm-hmm. you could see 
three, four, five, six guys come off the list, potentially, you know, will they play and stuff like that? Again, it obviously depends. You know, I feel like we saw kind of the wide range of sim or, you know, players that, you know, could hop right back on the ice. Whereas like with mm-hmm. Zach Aston Reese, it took him a little bit. So you hope it's more of, you know, guys like what did you, did Dumoulin already had it right. And he jumped right yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was someone that was symptomatic and his first mm-hmm. game was that awful loss in Washington. And he looked pretty bad in that one. Yeah. So yeah, that's something where a guy was symptomatic and he came back and you could tell that it was still affecting yeah. him. But so hopefully these guys won't go through that. Yeah. yeah. And the, honestly, the other benefit kind of of this extended break is that it gave the penguins time to not only hopefully kind of see their way through the COVID situation, but get healthy in general Mm -hmm. because Jake Gensel is now seemingly good to go from his upper body injury. Fractured knuckle. That's what fractured knuckle. Fractured knuckle. (laughs) That sounds not right from Seattle. Yeah. He blocked the shot in Seattle. He he didn't really block. It was like he, didn't it, t- it just hit him but yeah in just, the hand we, we, we saw him around the press box he had like a brace on for a couple days but uh fractured knuckle but <laughs> sounds like he'll play yeah, he's, he's coming back uh brian rust is coming back and then pro- taylor you were saying probably not for sunday but maybe for the upcoming west coast trip Evgeny Malkin yeah. could come back as soon as that. Yeah, oh my God. he just started skating with full contact on Monday, and he just spoke for the first time since his injury on Wednesday. And I did ask him if he has a sense of when he'll uh, be coming back. Uh, is he a possibility for Sunday? Because that is the Penguins' next game. And he said no chance for Sunday. Uh, he's hoping for the the West the West Coast trip. Um, they do have a, another home game in between then, but the, the West Coast trip, I believe it b- begins on January 8th. Um, and that, mm-hmm. that trip is Dallas, um, the California cities, and then Vegas. So it, it's a long trip, he said. He said for mm-hmm. sure sometime during then. So it's not that far off, whenever it may be. Oh my God, that is so exciting because it feels like simultaneously, it feels like we've been waiting forever for him to come back, but also it feels like that time just flew like in a blink. Oh my goodness. Probably not for him, but (laughs) for us watching, um, how, how does he seem? Does he seem ready to come back? I haven't really had a chance to watch anything from, from today. Yeah. Uh, he said his knee feels 200% stronger. Uh, so that's good. Wednesday was the first practice where he took line rushes in his normal spot as the second line center. Before that, he had been um, mixing in on the fourth line. He was skating on Sid's wing for a little bit just so he could get in. Um, when he first came back, they had him skating on defense of the line rushes. Mark Friedman today actually called him his D partner. But uh, <laughs> so he, um, but yeah, Wednesday he just started – he was skating on a line between Carter and Heinen. Um with the personnel they have, uh, and he looks good. I mean, he's taking contact. Uh, he's very upbeat. He's bringing a lot of energy to the practices. I mean, he's celebrating hard after every single goal scored. I mean, he's ready. Uh, he's also arguing about missed like penalty calls and offside calls in these drills. <laughs> <laughs> like Wednesday's practice, it was funny. Like Reardon was pretending to be the be, be the official. They don't actually call penalties in the practices, um, but Reardon was kind of standing on the sidelines and he'd like put his arm up anytime uh, it would be penalty happened, and he didn't do oh it for God. some. And Malkin's arguing about it, and like there were some offside calls that were missed, and then like Malkin's arguing with Dumoulin, like you were offside. <laughs> Dumoulin's like, no, I wasn't. Like. So uh, it's funny, yeah. Malkin, I don't know. That's that's like midseason for Malkin, uh, just bullying people in practice. So uh, yeah, I mean, he seems like fired up, ready to go. I can't wait to watch him. Uh, so whenever I know that this is a totally different scenario, but it seems like because the Penguins deal with injuries so frequently every single year to key players, we I mean, we talk about it all the time, you know. Whenever guys start to return to the lineup, it throws their game off because they do settle into that sort of like next man up mentality and they play really, really well. And they were playing really, really well before this kind of um, off the cuff holiday break. Um, 
Do you think that there's going to be any kind of learning curve or adjustments that need to be made once they come back and boom, they're like 98% back to the lineup that they've been planning for all season? Jenna, do you think we're going to see any drop off at all based on that as a result of that? You hope that that momentum carries over, but I feel like just when I, I, my mind immediately goes back to, and granted, obviously this was so different, but like the pause in March of 2020, when the Flyers were like the hottest team in the league and then like fell straight off the face of the earth. Granted, it's the Flyers. You kind of almost (laughs) expect some sort of collapse with them at some point throughout everything. I'm not trying to say that in a totally disparaging way, but just that's kind of what you see Mm -hmm. and expect. I, I think it's going to depend on who they get back. Like if they have, if come Sunday, you have the full lineup, if you know, six of the eight guys come off the COVID list and maybe you're missing like a guy on defense and one of the forwards or something like that. I I don't think you'll see it. it. It would be interesting to me if like they get their entirely healthy lineup and how they'll look. But I think also among these guys, there's a little bit of a sense of probable frustration because Mm -hmm. you and again like you know shoulda coulda woulda type thing realistically they could have played at least the flyers they should have probably played that game at least in my opinion before the break they probably should have played that game and then it's kind of like okay depending on what could happen because then you would have either had the win streak continue or you would have okay we suffered a loss we're going to go into the holiday break and kind of reconfigure things but Mm -hmm. i think there's a sense of frustration where it's like you know we didn't get to play we probably could have played also we did what we were supposed to do and we come back and all of a sudden we have all these guys on the COVID list that is probably going to get to them so i think if they're missing a chunk of the lineup you might still kind of see them carry things over I don't think we're going to see a drastic drop off because of the way Mm -hmm. that this team plays and I think it obviously goes back to playing in the system but I'm going to be very intrigued to kind of see how teams come back because you'll really Mm -hmm. kind of start to see I think the teams that can separate themselves the Floridas the Tampa Bays the Boston's you know those the types of the teams that were you know the Flames that were playing really high caliber hockey you're Mm -hmm. going to see those teams kind of jump up to that level I think the Penguins can kind of get back, but, you know, sometimes you see this team go through ups and downs where, oh, we have everybody else, you know, Sid's back, Gino's back. We can kind of take our foot off the gas a little bit. Uh, Yeah. So I'm going to be intrigued kind of see, but I I think you can see, expect good things from this team. Now it's like, Hey, we're finally healthy. Look at all the talent we have. We're going to continue goal scoring at the pace for goal scoring. Yeah. Uh, Here's hoping at least. Taylor, what's one thing that you're going to be keeping an eye on once they eventually do start hopefully playing games again on Sunday? I mean, I was hoping to see Casper Bjorkquist, but <laughs> he, <laughs> you know, he's been in the organization for, for a while. He's had the worst luck with, with injuries and stuff like that. And uh, he gets called up and it seems like he's going to get in because of all the, the COVID issues. But I think, you know, the NHL shortening the isolation requirement is actually going to hurt him because now they might not need him uh, for Sunday. Um, but I mean, he, if, if he does get in, cause again, we don't know if any, like the fours are symptomatic, if they're going to be able to come back by Sunday. Um, but if he's able to play, I mean, he's, he's someone that I would absolutely be, be focusing on just, um, he's so much fun to watch in Wilkes-Barre. Uh, self-admittedly not happy with his offensive production this year, but that's really not his role. Um, very defensive forward, uh, physical block shots. We had, when we had Derek Army on the podcast, you know, we talked about him uh, because he followed him because they both went to Providence College, not at the same time, but Derek Army just should have kept up with, with Providence. And um, he said, you know, he's someone that's never going to be out of position. You just know what you're going to get from him. You can put him in top line, fourth line, you know what you're going to get. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd, I'd like to see him get in a game, but I don't know if it's going to happen. He's, again, had, like, the worst luck this season, too. I mean, what la- well, last season, two seasons ago, he, tor- he collided with a teammate in practice towards ACL, done for the year after six games. Oh, and then with hurts. COVID last year, you know, a lot – because the AHL started late, a lot of the European players, teams just kept them in – Europe for the year, so he he was in Europe all of last in Finland all of last year, and then this year um, he just missed a, a month of just about with um, he got cut by a skate, and then while he was recovering from that he got COVID, um, so he's had the worst luck, and it's not anything you can say like oh he's like injury prone because it's like these random things and getting cut by a skate that's not like 
no one's prone to getting cut by a skate. Like that's just awful luck. <laughs> so um, I'd, I'd like to see him finally get a shot after everything he's been through, but uh, we'll have to wait and see. Well, why don't we take a quick break? When we come back, we can talk about some other developments across the league that have to do with the Olympics. So let's get ready and get sad. Uh, We'll be right back. And we're back. So the NHL also made some splashes in the headlines this week in regards to the Olympics, and it wasn't good news at all. So, Taylor, why don't you clue us in a little bit on what's going on over there? Yeah, I mean, they agree that they're not going to participate in the Olympics this year, so it's two straight Olympics without NHLers or uh, NHL staff, which, I mean, just just really sucks because, I mean, what the Penguins were supposed to have – Mike Sullivan, be head coach of Team USA. Um, Teddy Bluger with, with Latvia, uh, Crosby and, yeah. and Malkin. Um, you know, Gensel Russ maybe even capping in for Finland. You know, there's probably going to be a lot of Penguin participation in these Olympics, but uh, they're not going. Yep. Not really surprised. I mean, the NHL, they did have that built-in break right after the All-Star game for the Olympics with um, the contingency that, you know, if they don't go, they're going to, use that break to make up games or reschedule games. And uh, with all the games that have been postponed, I think it's over 80 now, they're going to need those couple weeks. So that's why. And then, I mean, there are also concerns with just, you know, what happens if you go to China and you test positive? Uh, teams could be without, you know, players and star players at the Olympics for a long time. So not surprising that it happened, but it, it still just sucks. Yeah. And like, what's super intriguing about this, we're going to reschedule games during this break. Like all of the arenas have Mm -hmm. things crazily scheduled and it's not like little things like here in Pittsburgh, like monster jam, monster jam, (laughs) Billie (laughs) Eilish concert. There's like John Mayer, John Mayer. Yeah. They're huge things. It's Mm -hmm. like, it was kind of one of those, okay, you probably should have been like, okay, we need to at least a lot this amount of time. Like, you, th- you would have yeah. thought it would have been more thinking, I guess. Yeah. There, there isn't much thinking in terms of planning with the NHL, it doesn't seem. It's kind of like they just they wing it, and they're like, well, we'll figure it out somewhere down the line, maybe, if we're lucky. Yeah. And what seems is like we're missing – Players in their prime getting to play for their national team. Something uh-huh. for these guys that obviously their careers in the NHL mean so much. But, like, I feel like every guy you talk to when they play for the Olympics says, like, there's nothing else like it. There's nothing else like playing for your country on a world stage. And we're missing, you know, Sidney Crosby, Evgeny Malkin, like, even just, like, bigger picture, you know, Nathan McKinnon, like, mm-hmm. you know, Connor McDavid, these, I mean, world-class, world-class athletes playing on, it, like, almost super teams. Like, yeah. it's just, it's so disappointing. It really is. And you get yeah. it for health and safety, but also it's like, they're, they're, you would have thought there could have been something. I don't know. Yeah, I, It sucks, I think, of the Penguins players, I feel bad for. I mean, I feel bad for all of them. Uh, I mean, like Crosby and Malkin, you don't know if they're going to get another chance to play in the Olympics yeah. you know, in, in four yeah. years. But like uh, Teddy Bluger, again, like Latvia, not a lock to make the Olympics in men's hockey every year. They qual- they earned their way into this tournament. They played in the qualifying tournament. Teddy Bluger, captain Latvia, he was a big part of that team. And, you know, he, he helped them earn their way in. Um, yeah. And, you know, you don't even know if Latvia is going to make the Olympics next time around, let alone, you know, Bluger making the team. So. Uh, mm-hmm. it's yeah, a lot of missed opportunities for these. And like you said, like seeing like Crosby and McDavid on the same team, uh, like, are we ever going to see that? How amazing. Um, God. yeah, it's, it's tough. And well, cause you know what, we're now Russia's just going to win the Olympics, right? Cause mm-hmm. the KHL's going, this is what happened in 2018. Yeah. The K, the NHLers don't go, the K, the KHL still goes and well, it wasn't, it was the Olympic athletes from Russia. They won gold. So Probably that's going to happen again, you got to think, because uh, without the NHL participation. So, I don't know. It just takes the fun out of watching. I know, like, with the time mm-hmm. change, like, in China, how many people are going to stay up to watch it anyway over here? And now that we're, like, no NHLers, like, it just really zaps a lot of the fun out of it. 
Yeah, it sure does. And I know players are really, really upset about it. Brad Marchand had some some words to say. Taylor, you have that quote, Yeah, right? I mean, it's, it's a whole paragraph. Um, it, basically, him saying that, you know, it still should be up to the players whether or not they go um, individually. Um, and that there's swears in this and I can't read the full thing, but, um, but, you know, uh, making, he said, why can't it be, you know, the player's choice to forfeit their pay and still go? Why can't we do that? Um, he said, let the players make their choice. Uh, and because, you know, it was already agreed upon and part of the C- CBA. So, um, part of the, you know, NHL's reason for pulling out is revenue and, you know, missing out from, from these games. But I mean, Marshawn's point was, um, you know, the owners, if they lose out on revenue, we're already going to pay that back in escrow. Like we talked about in the last segment to ensure mm-hmm. that the new 50 split. So basically he's saying like the players should be able to choose to give up their money in order to go do this. Um, I, I, I agree with him. Um, I think if someone yeah. wants to go, uh, they should let him. I, you would still probably see some of the stars pull out of the Olympics and stay back. Um, mm-hmm. because they don't want to risk, you know, being away from their teams. But I, I feel like some NHL players would still go. Yeah. yeah. And that's – it's interesting that the league would pull just kind of a, a trump card and, and say that, no, the NHL as a whole is just not going. Because it's – it like you've both said, you've shared this sentiment – it's not about the NHL. It's not about the teams. It's about the individual players who want to go represent their countries. And it is such a shame that they're not able to even have the choice to go do that should they want to. And yeah, I mean, I, I too, I'm just very bummed um, because I would have, I would have stayed up nice and late to watch the Olympics with all of those superstars in it, but now I'm like, seriously, what is the point? I, I'm, I have a very hard cutoff for my bedtime, so it's not that flexible for you now. And, and I think we had USA Canada on like Valentine's Day at midnight. I'm like, sign me up. Yeah. Oh my God. It's like a That's drug. Mean. Give it to me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the women's tournament should still be, still be exciting. So like, I'm going to stay and watch that. Yeah. And that's kind of how it was in 2018 too. Like I'm definitely going to watch yeah. that USA Canada, especially when they go head to head. But uh, I, the men's <laughs> side, I can't, I mean, I'm going to watch Finland because I like Finland, but like even, <laughs> I, I think it'll be interesting to see who makes up these rosters now for, you know, like mm-hmm. USA Canada. Cause you look back at 2018, we knew ahead of time that the NHL wasn't going to go and that, so that also rules out NHL prospects on NHL contracts, even if they're not in the NHL. Um, so, you know, the guys like pull in, like right down in the AHL, they can't go because they're on an NHL contract. So what happened in 2018 was a lot of the guys who made like the older kind of borderline AHL, NHL players signed AHL contracts on purpose to keep their eligibility. Mm-hmm. Um, like Wilkesbury in 2018 had a guy go to the Olympics and I talked to him um, before and he had NHL contract offers, um, but he signed an AHL deal with Wilkesbury in, to try to keep that uh, eligibility. And because we thought the NHL NHLers were going this year, guys didn't do that. There was kind of borderline guys. Those guys mm-hmm. went and signed NHL contracts because they could get them. So, uh, I mean, some AHLers are going to make up these rosters, but um, I don't know. It's going to be it's going to be a weak group. And even like. College guys, they're not – NCAA is not going to want them going over. Junior teams, not going to want yeah. them going over. I mean, they'll probably let them go in juniors, but um, it'll be super interesting. And you do kind of almost wonder – I mean, obviously we want to hope that, like, people will trend in a good direction with Omicron in the next couple of weeks, months, but, like, there's still a potential that the Olympics themselves could get pushed. Uh, yeah. Which, Which in a way, way yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Like in a way, you're kind of almost like, all right, we'll just push them to next year, and like that way, everybody kind of gets what they want. Mm-hmm. But then again, there's you know so many caveats and things like that. Like we also don't know where we'll be in a year from now. Yeah. Oh my God. There's so much unknown. It's stressful. Yeah. But it it is a bummer for sure that the NHL isn't going, and 
We have even more bad news. Well, why don't we take one more break and we'll be back to just hit you over the head some more. <laughs> And we're back. One final piece of bad news for you. People all over the world were looking forward to the World Juniors. Uh, it was very exciting. And we were like, well, at least we have that. That's something to look forward to. And they said, uh, the IIHF said, just kidding. We're, we're going to cancel both the men's and the women's World Juniors. So there you go. Uh, and I know that Taylor has the full scoop on that, as well as some grievances that she would like to air. So I'm going to give you the floor. You run wild and um, yeah, just go for it. Yeah. So the way this started is the, the IIHF, um, they said they were canceling all of the tournaments starting in January, which does not include the, the men's U20 tournament, the main World Juniors tournament. Um, but that does include the top division women's world juniors. It's, it's U18. It's not U20, but U18 for the women. That is the top. Um, and they, so they canceled the top division. And now you go back to last year, COVID, they moved the men's U20 world juniors. They postponed it, did mm-hmm. everything they can to make it work. But they didn't try to postpone the women's one last year. And then it's kind of the same thing this year where they're doing anything they can to make the men's U20 tournament happen. But they're not even trying to postpone the women's U20 tournament, the U18 tournament. And it just, it's just super frustrating because, you know, you look at it and you're like, this is about money. Um, and then the IIHF did come out and release a statement. They're like, yeah, it was about the money. Um, because they're, yeah, they're like, you know, the men's you know, U20 tournament, we get the money from that to, to help fund the other tournaments which again then doesn't make sense because then what are you funding if you're canceling all the other tournaments (laughs) but yeah we need to have it to fund the other tournaments but also like yeah of course like the women's u18 is not the money maker that the men's u20 is but the men's u20 also this is something that happens whenever people talk about men's and women's sports they talk about the men's side like you know it was just formed as this big money maker but no like you have people invested resources into it, marketing to build it up, mm-hmm. to get it to where it is. And it became a moneymaker. Yep. But when it's the women's sports, they're just somehow expected to be these big money makers without getting the same investment that the oh men God. got. So the thing I, I I've tweeted a couple times. Is, so the last time they had this women's tournament, you look at like the broadcasts from it and it looks like it's being filmed on someone's like ring doorbell. Like it's a fisheye. It's not moving. It's just a fisheye show in the whole rink. And it's it's this it was Canada Russia when you know the, this the first game that that year, and it's a completely unwatchable stream. And it's like, how do you expect this women's tournament to to get bigger and get more attention, and become a money maker like the men's side is when you can't even pay for like a real camera? Like it it literally like like a ring doorbell. So that's why it's so frustrating. And then, like the IHF, they put out like condescent like a huge statement about like trying to justify it. Oh um, and like Luke Tardif, who's in charge, who runs IIHF, uh, he said, you know, I'm disappointed in the cancellations, but more disappointed that there are statements saying that the IIHF is treating women like second class people. And it's like, well, when have they shown us otherwise? Like you go yeah. back again, just to the broadcast, something that's simple and they can't even invest like the bare minimum uh, to that. And, you know, he's in the statement, he's like, look, because the world juniors, there are many levels i mean the men's you know there's the d1a d1b d2a d2b like it goes down to even the smallest of countries have you know their own tournament and he's like we had to cancel men's tournaments too it's like yeah the the very low mm-hmm. ones yeah. um but even like the the men the u20 they had the second level tournament happened that yeah. it, it went through it, it's already over latvia won gold in that tournament um and and then they they were going to try to go through with the men's U20, the top division, cancel that Wednesday because uh, it was completely bungled. I mean, they had Switzerland, USA um, get canceled because USA had positive tests. Finland and Czechia, which is what you call the Czech Republic now, Czechia. Um, that was new, by the way. Yeah, was that, that was new. Was they just, just, it was, yeah, the 
Czechia, they put out like a press release like just before the tournament. Like, by the way, call us this now. So they're Czechia. <laughs> I rod to Rod Taylor type thing. Oh my God. Sorry. Connor <laughs> Sherry, Connor Sherry. Yeah. Um, they did it. Break. And then uh, Wednesday, Russia, uh, Russia, Slovakia postponed because well, canceled because of the test on Russia. And that's what ended up canceling the whole thing. But um, yeah, like there's like reports coming out of the way this was handled. Um, the tournament, it was held in Edmonton in, and Red Deer in Alberta, not in a bubble. Um, there was Corey Pronman, a uh, reporter who covers prospects. He said, you know, one staff member um, on a team in, in the hotel said that the lack of isolation from the community was ridiculous and they're coming into contact with wedding guests. And it's like, of course, you're going to have, you know, COVID make its way into the tournament when they're not oh isolated at all. Um, so <laughs> I don't know what they expected. Um, I feel like the IHF needs new leadership for completely bungling the women's thing, not even trying. And then they have the men's tournament. And like, I don't know, again, what, what, what do you expect? They didn't put them in a bubble. COVID's going to happen. Like, you're telling me, too, yeah. like, you're the IIHF. You couldn't have blocked out, like, a, like, make, even just one hotel or, like, two hotels and say, like, each team is, you know, stuck to their floor. You walk in at certain times. You have different entrances. Mm -hmm. Like, there was a way to do this because we saw the bubble work yeah. last year. Obviously, mm -hmm. like, you were able to crown a champion in what at the time was a really intense part of the pandemic. Like, you're yeah. telling me there's no lot. Like, how how did nobody think that, like, hmm, maybe we shouldn't do this? Well, okay. in Red Deer, we were talking about before we started recording, in Red Deer, Alberta, you can't find a hotel to yourself in Red Deer, Alberta. What is happening in Red Deer, Alberta in the middle of, of the winter that you can't block off a hotel just for the tournament? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Rent out a Holiday Inn. How much can it be in Red Deer, Alberta? Of all um, oh my god! Just, like, yeah, it just this whole thing's a mess. Um, yeah, but yeah, IIHF not not the greatest look for them. Uh, probably need new leadership. Uh, just and again, like the the statement that they had put out when they canceled the women's tournament got a, a ton of flack. Just reading that and like the condescending tone and the whole thing, it's like, do they not have like a PR person either? Like, how did this get through? Like, yeah. um, did nobody super, bet this? Yeah, super disappointing. Um, I mean, because again, like the, I feel, I you feel awful for the, for the guys and the U twenty tournament, but I mean the the women's U eighteen, that's such a big deal because. Um, you know, that's where, you know, they get noticed for getting scouted for colleges. And this is now two years where that's such a big part of their development and it's not mm. happening. And again, yeah, like it's not going to be a, the, the biggest money maker. It hasn't even been around that long, this tournament. Like I think the first year was 2009. Like the first U18 tournament oh, had word. like Hillary Knight and Marie Philippe Plan, like these women who are still playing, whereas like the men's U20 tournament has been around forever. Mm. Um and again, it wasn't a big money maker, but they put the money into it. It's on TV, you know, huge marketing goes into it. Mm. Now it's the biggest thing mm. ever. Um, maybe even bigger than like the world championships, but they don't want to put anything into the women's tournament. And then they're like, well, it doesn't make any money. It's like, well, yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you have uh, to invest before you see a return on your investment. I yeah. Feel like that's common sense for any type of business. Yeah, I mean, you see it with like like the women's hockey, like the pro the professional women's hockey league, and they're like, well, it just doesn't make any money. But like the NHL wasn't profitable making all this money to begin with either. But yeah, you know, they put the money in and then build it up. It just yeah. like in when we're talking about like you know men's sports, women's sports, and making money, the men got like a hundred year head start, um, and then the women are expected to come in <laughs> hundred years later without the same uh, investment and uh bring in the same amount of money or at least be profitable and it, it just it just can't work like that and for the iihf to do that like the governing body of hockey around the world it, it just it's just super disappointing it's sad and like we've been saying like you have to you have to invest in order to see something like you have to continue to grow something i mean you're seeing that with and i'm terrible with because they just changed the affiliation so what used to be the nwhl is now, is it the P, I'm thinking. Premier Hockey Federation. The PHF, I was gonna say yeah. PWHL, mm -hmm. but the PHF. Um, you're seeing, you know, when these games were broadcast on NBC Sports and when on Twitch, you're seeing so much viewership because 
hmm, shocking. If you market something and you give it to people, they're going to probably want it. You're going to market it to an average hockey fan. They're going to be like, hey, let me tune in and see, oh, this incredible amount of talent. That's like a bunch of women from the national teams that you know and colleges that have, you know, performed incredibly well. Like there is a market for this. It's not like there Mm -hmm. isn't a market for this. And it's like, give them an opportunity. Don't take things away from them, you know. It, you, you know, it's just, it's unfortunate right now that like, obviously men's sports do garner so much more money. The main professional leagues, men's leagues, especially in the United States, garner a lot more money, but like the WNBA is a perfect example. Like everything is up with them. Viewership, the audience reach, everything of that, because hmm, shocking, you market it and you send it out to people and say, Hey, this is why you should watch. They're probably going to watch. Mm-hmm. And I mean, even like men's sports teams are not all profitable, but people like yeah. the, the money that the Coyotes lose every year could fund a women's league. Like, <laughs> but because you know they're seeing the value in the men's sport, we're gonna keep funding the Coyotes. Um, <laughs> so when, again, you could put that money into you know the women's game, see much better, uh, you know, product, and mm-hmm. it just goes also just the opportunities they get from, from kids. Um, is the women's game the same as the men's game? No, but like uh, you look at like the premier hockey fit, like the women's hockey league, half of those women have, most of those women have other jobs, like full-time yeah. jobs. And it's like, you, you're not even getting the, the best product you can possibly get out of these women because like, I mean, they're paying for their own equipment. They're oh my God. practicing weird times. They can't practice as much as the men because they can't afford to. Um, but then again, they're expected to, it's not going to be the same product when they don't get the same level of, of investment. And I mean, the opportunities that the boys have from such a young, I mean, the the U S uh, national team development program, it's to develop boys to end up being, you know, Olympians, um, for team USA. And so many of the, you know, big team USA stars have come out of that program. There is no equivalent for the women. Um, so it, it it just it just you just need to invest in women's sports um, if you want to see a better product uh, and then you know they can be more of a money maker but uh, it's not going to get that without the money. No, money is everything. I don't understand why people won't get that. And yeah. so basically, to sum it up, the IAHF sucks. Fire Luke Tardif. He's the the guy yep. in charge of this whole thing. Get him out of there. Who I picture as some type of like high school boy sitting in his parents basement of making decisions about a uh, hockey league um and pay women at, at fund women that that's pretty simple i don't know i feel like we're solving the world's problems here Look, if gary easy. bettman would give us a call about the olympics i'm sure we could finagle some stuff and get them there so all good um but everybody thanks for listening as always to another episode of podcast on fifth Ave. if you like it make sure you're subscribed on the YouTube channel or wherever it is you listen to podcasts. We have new episodes that drop every Thursday. So make sure you're here again next week for another new episode.